Um, thank you for that, those introductory remarks. I think the framework of sort of um, laying out the neo-Ottoman aspirations uh, and in a sense how a reality check has been incurred uh, is a useful introduction to what I will say in moving forward. The first part of my speech, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the interaction between the domestic policy of Turkey and the foreign policy of Turkey. And I think in particular with regard to the Arab world, you see that there's this very strong interplay between these two. In the second section, I will talk more about Turkey's regional policies uh, towards the Arab world and the paradoxes or the weaknesses uh, thereof. Um, so domestic policy and, and foreign policy, I mean, one thing that we can see uh, in the last 10 years, let's say, is that the government of Turkey has um, had a strong economic uh, theme, let's say, or economic drive built into its foreign policy. And of course, economic opportunities from the region that are uh, fueled by good relations with, with neighborhood countries has, brings back kickbacks when it comes to domestic politics, because it ensures um, economic uh, growth and, and, and opportunities for Turkish businesses and, and whatnot. Another dimension where uh, domestic and foreign policy interact is that the neighborhood countries have um, uh, ways and means in which to stir up conflicts within Turkey, ethnic and sectarian, and therefore reducing the confrontation with neighboring countries has kickbacks again for domestic governance issues. A third way um, uh, that they interact is that the, sort of the regional influence of Turkey, the sort of grandeur uh, that's presented uh, by the government, has uh, domestic, you know, feeds into domestic public opinion with sort of uh, driving a sense of pride in the country and sort of the dreams of Turkish um, regional uh, power. And the fourth one, which is the one I want to elaborate a little bit more, on is um, this whole debate about Turkey as a model, how Turkey's dom domestic achievements uh, and its potential to demonstrate that democracy and Islam can coexist have actually fed into Turkey's, Ankara's, AKP's uh, geostrategic position um, with domestic political consequences that are not all positive. So that's, that's one that I want to, uh, to talk a little bit more about. Um, in 2004, I was working for a Turkish NGO, and this was a time when the Middle East, the greater Middle East conception was uh, drawn up uh, in the United States. And, and Turkey, within that conception, was, was branded as a sort of a model of moderate Islam, so alternate, an alternative to Iran or to the radical Islam myths of the neighborhood. There was a view that the Turkish moderate Islam make model, modern Islam model, could um, uh, sort of uh, be, be something around which Arab societies might be able to organize a non-anti-West, non-radical version of how to, how to govern. Um, and there was a lot of counter opinions among the Turkish civil society at that time to this position. And again, in 2009, when I was working for another Turkish NGO, there was a great advocacy among certain sort of Turkish Democrats that Obama not make his Middle East speech in Turkey in 2009, that he find another country from which to address the Middle Eastern people, Muslims. And in fact, it, it, he didn't. He, he, made a, he came to, April, to Turkey in April 2009, made a more European speech, and then went to Egypt and made a more Muslim world speech. So back then, there was still uh, some kind of um, question marks. But once, you know, come the Arab Spring, those question marks, in a way, dissipated, in that um, it became futile to argue against branding Turkey uh, a Muslim uh, Middle East democracy, let's say, because of the strategic dividends that this whole rhetoric seemed to give Turkey, and because of a number of domestic developments in Turkey in the meantime. Of course, also playing into this was the fact that in Tunisia and Egypt, for example, this was embraced, AKP as the model uh, that they would like to um, emulate, it was an embraced concept. But I want to remind you, or remind myself, of the arguments that were made in between 2004 and 2009 about why this might not be good for Turkish democracy, because I think it's very striking how many of the concerns actually realized. Back then, theoretically, it made sense to me, but I had no way to envision how it would really play out. So I think it's really interesting uh, to look back right now. One, there are four arguments that I remember, that I, note, I jotted down. 
One of them was that Turkey would have to become more Islamic to have the credentials to play a leadership role in the Middle East. A second one was that Turkey would be compared to its Muslim neighbors as, appro as opposed to its European counterparts when it comes to democracy standards. So it would be, you're better than Egypt, not you're not as good as Spain. Um, a third one was that this model debate had one political actor of Turkey at its center, and it was actually the AKP model, not the Turkey model, that was um, often uh, what the narrative was based on, which of course, it um, injects a level of um, uh, support for a political party somewhat artificially from outside, uh, somewhat the way the Turkish military had uh, an immunity vis-a-vis uh, -vis what it did domestically because of its great strategic importance uh, uh, in the, during the uh, Cold War and, and, and before. So, uh, no, during the Cold War and the 90s. Um, and the fourth one, was that to the extent that Turkey's European integration is undermined, um, a vision that can unite the diverse segments of the Turkish society would be lost, and that it would be very hard to find um, any other um, vision for the country that would be able to bring together uh, the, 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 the divergent uh, segments of the Turkish society. And indeed, when we look back, all of these seem to have happened. Uh, but more, actually, has also happened in that you know, I work for, besides the journal that I publish, a European think tank called the European Stability Initiative. And between 2004 and 2010, we were constantly comparing Turkey to European countries that had gone through similar experiences and trying to um, sort of take lessons from reform efforts. Now, we find that European audiences are much more interested in talking about how Turkey is similar to or different from uh, different countries within the Middle East. So the debate has changed, and the debate is not also about Turkey, it's not about candidacy, it's not about accession, it's about what they call strategic dialogue. It's about how our shared concerns in the Middle East, um, uh, you know, how we can deal with um, Turks and Europeans together. Um, uh, we saw in the recent Gezi Park protests in Turkey that the moment the West is critical of the Turkish government, the conspiracy that comes forth is that the West is trying to prevent Turkey's rise as a regional power. Um, uh, so, you know, there's a certain immunity there, or a certain uh, reversion to geostrategic ar arguments. So we can't really talk about our own problems. We have to talk about Turkey's uh, importance in the region. And I think it's worthwhile to also note that to the degree that the government has developed a strong uh, regional influence, and to the extent, I, I'd like to underline to the extent, it really hasn't used this to moderate the anti-West sentiments, the anti-Israel sentiments, and, and whatnot in either Turkey or, or, or the Muslim neighborhood. And indeed, you know, as, I, as I mentioned, I think we have much less discussion about, um, about European benchmarks and much more about uh, how well we're doing in compare, comparison to other Muslim countries. So that, indeed, that model debate, and I think very much fueled by, by Washington, um, uh, ended up being counterproductive and playing into a, a direction of Turkey that's not necessarily um, good for the entire uh, uh, society. So second part of my speech, I'd like to talk a little about, about, the, about the regional policies of Turkey. And I, the first point I'd like to make is um, about deliverables, in that one can question or ask what actually Turkey's regional policies have delivered concretely. Of course, you can ask this about any other country as well. I mean, has the United States been able to maneuver the field in any way that's brought results? No. Has Europe? No. I mean, has any of the other sort of large global powers? No. But the thing is, Turkey, Turkey's difference there was Turkey had a claim. Turkey positioned itself or uh, drew up its rhetoric on the basis of being able to do this. So I think it's fair enough to, to hold Turkey to um, uh, to its own claims and, and analyze how much this has actually re been realized. When we look at Turkey's mediation efforts, so the sort of the formulas of win-win solutions that have been, have been put forth by the Turkish foreign ministry, none of them have really delivered results. Could they have? Is it Turkey's fault? I don't think it's Turkey's fault. But coming up with those conceptions obviously reflected uh, 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 un uh, unrealism. Uh, it was not. Uh, uh, it was not a realistic um, attempt, let's say, many of them. Um, uh, I think we can more or less see that Turkey's perceived 
as a supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood axis um, of many Middle Eastern countries, whether true or not, that's the way it's perceived. Um, but yet, when we look at the critical junctures where the Muslim Brotherhood af affiliates in the Middle East could have been, may have been influenced, we don't see that the AKP has actually been able to do so. There was an effort in 2001, uh, in September 2001, to sort of drive home the message of the, 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 the importance of secularism by the Turkish Prime Minister, a, a very good initiative, I think. It didn't yield results. We saw the period of constitution making in Egypt where the whole issue of um, protection of minorities was being debated. Turkey was not a part of that debate. It was absent. And, and most recently, in the removal of, of Morsi, we see the same thing. It's not like Turkey is able to steer the direction one way or another, nor should it necessarily um, be expected to. But the problem is looking, appearing to be so uh, aligned with the Muslim Brotherhood has led Turkey to be seen as a non-impartial actor or non-neutral partner by the rest. So the secular segments of these societies, the Shia in certain other countries of, of the region, uh, the liberals, they no longer see Turkey as, uh, as, as or not, are not as enthusiastic about Turkey's role in the region as they could have been had Turkey not um, not antagonize them with their support for the Muslim Brotherhood. You know, if it was not going to deliver the results that it was seeking to uh, with the Muslim Brotherhood, then maybe Turkey shouldn't have been aside so much and chosen aside in, in the societies uh, 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 of this region. Um, uh, so that the deliverables issue is one. Uh, the second one is I think Turkey's faltered in uh, settling the place of the West uh, within its vision uh, of its own foreign policy towards the region. And then I think in the long term, actually, Turkey's interests very much converge with the West in the region. Turkey is also uh, has the most to gain by the solution of conflicts, the economic development, and, 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 and interdependence in the Arab world, uh, open borders, more democracy. I mean, these are the kind of things that actually uh, Turkey and the West, uh, West meaning Europe, America, uh, all benefit from. Yet it's a paradox that Turkey, that, that the government has been has not incorporated this into its narrative at all. I mean, it, in fact, quite the contrary. There's a there's a West skepticism that comes across um, very uh, frequently. Of course, the democratization deficits of the country have not fared well in terms of Turkey's relations with the, with the West. To the extent that there were supporters within the EU of Turkey's accession or integration, they do not feel very motivated about Turkey today. Part mostly because of the last two years and and and. and the democracy track record. And I, I think they feel very much that Turkey is using uh, its regional influence as a bargaining chip vis-a-vis uh, -vis the West, as opposed to trying to come up with um, uh, a joint uh, efforts or, or joint visions uh, towards the region. For a country whose interests actually are so aligned with the West, this seems to be uh, puzzling. And. Um, Am I finished? Three minutes. Okay, I'll be fine in three minutes. I'll actually try to do two minutes. Um, and my, my, my last point, or my one from the last point in terms of paradoxes, is that no official mantra has been devised since the zero problems with neighbors mantra. And that you know, clearly the zero problems with neighbors was a good idea, but it didn't work. Not because of Turkey, but because of what the region is. Now, um, what's replaced it, it's not clear. Mm, the government officials often say that their stance is a principled stance, so it's not pragmatic, it's principled, it's next to the righteous, it's next to the victims, and whatnot. But then when you dig a little bit deeper, you know, that's how they explain the position towards Israel or Syria, but then there are many other victims of the region that are not extended the same uh, principle. Um, or and there are many other countries where uh, dissidents are fighting toward for democracy, that Turkey does not necessarily stand by. Uh, Azerbaijan could be one, the Shia in some other countries could be others. Um, so I think it's becoming clearer that Turkey either needs to devise a sort of a form of pragmatic rhetoric or narrative to fit what it's trying to do in the neighborhood. Um, you know, otherwise, there are too many countries in the neighborhood that we can't have relations with if, if, we, if we go by principles. There are just too many countries that, 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 that uh, violate the principles that Turkey claims to. Uh, 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 be making its foreign policy decisions on the basis of, or there needs to be a new set of principles that are defined from Ankara, because zero problems clearly doesn't hold anymore. And my final paradox that I'd like to 
um, no, it's not about the government, but it's about the opposition. And I, by the opposition, I don't necessarily mean political parties, but I mean the opponents of, uh, of the government, as including, but not limited to, uh, the political parties. And that they have not come up in Turkey with alternative visions for the region or alternative engagement uh, uh, strategies or networks. And I think that's a big loss in that Turkey's diversity uh, and its potential, its human potential, its intellectual potential is not actualized partially to, because the, the, the non-government actors, the, the, the actors that are not aligned with the government, uh, are absent from the field. So I think it's important to get to plug them into the field as well, to the extent that you know, the liberals in Turkey, do they have much contact with the liberals in Egypt? No, whereas that would be some way that Turkey's um, uh, added value could, could come up. And I think my, 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 my conclusion there, we're tying back to the beginning, is that one reason why the Turkish uh, opponents of the government are not doing this is because they're so bogged down in our own domestic political struggles. So again, the domestic and foreign policy overlap and that the Turkish NGOs, Turkish opposition parties, Turkish critical media and lawyers and whatnot have too much in their hands in Turkey to actually go out and try to um, support their partners uh, in, in, in the Arab world. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.